Um, cool. Thanks a lot for joining me, joining us, everyone. Um, also, I'm going to put another plug in for the film uh, next week because I saw it at the Wild and Scenic Environmental Film Festival, and it was one of my favorite films of the entire festival. Um, I met Faith, the uh, filmmaker, and um, just fanboyed to her for a long time, and it was slightly embarrassing, um, but she was wonderful, and the film's awesome, so definitely check it out. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about fire for half hour. Um, I've been working on a film called Elemental, which um, you can see here on the screen, uh, the cover image for. Um, I've been working on this film for uh, a little more than two years at this point, um, and it's been a fascinating two years. Uh, I got first got interested, um, re-engaged in this topic after the Eagle Creek fire, as so many folks in Oregon did. Um, but I'm going to start with a story that actually happened um, this fall, back in October, end of October. Um, I have been chasing fire for a couple of years now, um, trying to understand how it works in forests and in other landscapes um, and document it. Um, because I believe that people are dying and losing their homes and we're doing things that are hurting our forests and hurting our ecosystems that aren't making people safer, unfortunately. Um, and almost nothing made that more clear to me than being in the Kincaid fire um, in October. And so I don't know if folks remember the Kincaid fire, but it blew up. This is a photo from the 25th of October. Um, just this is a, a one of the cool new um, fire lookout towers that is uh, not personed, but cameraed. And you can access these photos um, online. And so um, this is what happened on the 25th, um, the morning of the 25th, uh, it blew up. It burned 50 homes um, just north of Santa Rosa, um, burning just east of Healdsburg, California. Um, and I went down there um, because I, I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to document um, what was going on and I wanted to really get images from a fire that would help um, teach some science about fire how homes burn down, how fires move on a landscape. Um, and I really got that opportunity in this fire. And so what happened is the wind blew real hard. There was a spark from a power line um, and it ignited this blaze that you see on the screen. Um, and that was, I believe, Thursday night. Um, Friday morning, you know, the fire was burning really fast through some places that, that did have some homes, but mostly very rural. Um, and then the winds died and the fire activity died down. And I drove, um, I was in LA at the time filming another fire. I drove up um, and I got in position um, to film because we knew that the winds were gonna come back um, Saturday night. So during that 24 hours of low wind time, um, the uh, firefighters that were um, on the scene spent you know, just the whole time um, with this amazing air show, building fire lines around a fire that um, had the potential to do a lot of damage to the communities nearby, um, Healdsburg and some other fire uh, communities like that. And so I'll show you this map. Um, this is where the fire was on the 25th. Um, you can see Geyserville over there um, is the closest community. and. Uh, on the night of the 26th, there was another red flag warning with huge wind potential um, to happen. We knew it was coming. Um, and so the fire was moving kind of this direction um, and was largely, and then I positioned myself, excuse me, um, you can see that arrow on the lower right side of the screen. Um, because what I wanted to do was film how fires move. And I knew that there was a, a, a huge wind about to start after midnight and positioned myself right there with a long lens and waited. And it was just eerily quiet for the first um, couple hours I was there. I was in very close connect, uh, communication with um, the public information officer um, from Cal Fire. And, um, and then all of a sudden, the winds went from about zero to 60 right away. And we started seeing um, in this area some fast moving clouds this is kind of the slower moving clouds earlier in the night and all of a sudden the winds turned on and the fire 
really lit up, started blowing up um, hard. And I was listening to the radio chatter um, and waiting for um, the call, basically waiting to hear what was going on with all those containment lines. 24 hours of containment lines have been put in, digging lines, dropping um, fire, flame retardant, dropping water on the fire um, to reinforce those lines. Um, there were 2,000 firefighters in the area um, working on preventing the fire from going into Healdsburg, um, Santa Rosa, other communities in the um, near area, uh, near there, <clears throat> Geyserville as well. And uh, I repositioned as soon as I heard, I heard this kind of scratchy radio call that in about 15 minutes from all of the firefighters pulling out and the wind um, really picking up, the fire had breached um, all containment lines. So it, I mean, those containment lines, they went quick um, and repositioned myself um, a little bit lower. You can see that arrow near Geyserville um, in the bottom left-hand part of the um, red fire outline. And pointing my long lens in the middle of the night with huge smoke plumes coming overhead um, at up into the wind, I was directly downwind of the fire and smoke was, you know, billowing. We could feel all sorts of embers all over the place. And we're just waiting um, with a handful of other media and a public information officer from Cal Fire waiting for this fire to come up over the hill. And we start seeing flames lap up over the hill. Um, and I will just, I'll never forget this just unbelievable roar of wind and fire burning thousands of acres fueled by 60 mile an hour winds coming straight at us. Um, and this was the first time I'd been in this situation. We were on a road, we knew we had good escape routes um, and we were waiting with, you know, Cal Fire. Um, there were, like I said, thousands of firefighters with um, an engine in almost every, every house, every driveway along this road, 128, that you can see on the map, um, that could had a fire engine in it. And they were looking to see if those homes were defendable. And the thing that was just so amazing to me was that we were all looking up the hill towards the fire when all of a sudden behind us, the house, the one house that didn't have a fire engine um, in it to put out spot fires, um, we started seeing some flames. We saw these fire engines heading towards uh, that direction. And then we really started to see um, some flames coming from behind us. The fire had suddenly jumped over a mile as we were looking at it um, to homes behind where everyone was. And um, on the downwind side of this home, uh, this is actually a winery as, uh, as well. The wind just kicked right up, blew an ember over. And from the inside, um, out basically burned um, this winery down while we watched. And there were, um, you know, 15 members of the press there. Um, and everyone saw it, the firefighters just saw it too late. Um, and it really impressed upon me how, how much goes into firefighting in a place like this and how important, you know, how, how in that extreme sort of an event, uh, it's, you know, if you don't have literally an engine in every um, driveway at every house, it's not going to work. And this is two years earlier, right? Um, Santa Rosa, uh, this is Coffee Park, uh, a subdivision that just burned down, right? So we have a problem. And um, fires are becoming more destructive. Um, and entering our communities at a rate that they haven't in the past and creating more damage than they have in the past. And that makes news, right? Um, and sadly, um, what often doesn't make news is, is the recovery because the problem is clearly not fire in the forest. Um, it's not fire in ecosystems that are very adapted to these, um, these disturbances, right? So this is a photo of Mount Hood um, from the 50s after a bunch of the trees in the foreground had burned. Um, and then a much more recent photo where these trees, you can see them 
green, they've grown back. This is part of the ecosystem that's always happened. And this is a fascinating one, Mount Hood as well, right? These ecosystems are born in fire, um, they've adapted and they've evolved with fire. And here you can see in the top one um, in the 50s, uh, burned trees in the foreground, green trees in the background, um, even though it's black and white. And then in, in, in 2016, um, the burned and green trees have flipped in just 60 some years, a little closer image of that. Um, and there are all kinds of amazing um, things that happen in a forest after it burns, right? Here's a pretty high intensity burn um, just outside of Yosemite. These are blackback woodpeckers um, who are specially adapted to um, burned landscapes. They uh, are only found in pretty high intensity, um, almost only found in high intensity uh, burn areas after the burn. They go after um, the beetles larvae that they lay in the trees and they need a whole bunch of larvae to, um, to thrive. And so if you ever wanna see this bird, go to a burn landscape. Um, and this kind of a mosaic pattern that happens of high intensity, mid intensity, low intensity, creates um, a, a whole bunch of food, a whole bunch of little uh, niches to find food that didn't exist before. So here's a bear um, in Yosemite I uh, filmed last summer. And this bear is pulling up all the bark on these trees to eat the grubs. Um, and this is just this consistent food source that's there um, in these downed trees. And he makes his way through this burn forest almost every day. I saw him um, as a forest burns, little uh, small mammals thrive and then bigger mammals come and eat them. Um, it's a cougar uh, on Mount Hood. And that is true as well for raptors. Here's a goshawk. Goshawks often will make nests in low intensity burn patches that are very close to high intensity burn patches because that's where the small mammals are. Same is true for spotted owls like this one. You can see he's living in and hunting in a, uh, a kind of low intensity um, burn area. Um, and these are also pretty beautiful areas to enjoy, um, right outside of Yosemite, inside of Yosemite, um, all of these areas of burn, and they come right back um, just like they always have. Also, um, you know, one of the amazing benefits of, of natural or of, of fires like this is that they do create um, a bit of a fire break for a while, right? It's a lot less likely for these areas to burn now that they've uh, been burned. So for about a decade, a little bit more, um, you have a little bit of um, lower intensity, lower likelihood of a fire coming there. Um, and so, um, what I've been spending a lot of this last two years documenting is the fact that inside of a forest, in these places that um, we think of that burn, um, fire is truly not a problem. It's not, uh, you know, when it's, uh, it's really not an issue for um, the forest or the um, animals that live there. And it's also not uh, as much of an issue for climate change um, as sometimes we think. Uh, or sometimes we're told. Um, here's a, the same um, high intensity burned landscape. Um, and, and here's obviously an unburned forest. The reason um, I, I've, I've been fascinated by um, some of uh, Dr. Bev Law, um, uh, Lisa Ells, uh, Ellsworth, uh, a lot of um, studies coming out on forest carbon in fires, showing that um very little of the carbon actually is burned and released that wouldn't already be burned so if you look at this image you see um, a really nice uh, old growth landscape and um, you can see all of these bushy trees um, leafed out with um, needled out um, and then you see uh, excuse me and what you're looking at all the green stuff that's small stuff um, and that's the sort of thing that burns in a fire. Um, a lot of that stuff um, falls to the forest floor um, and begins to rot. And when things rot, they let off carbon, right? So when you, um, when you see a forest fire moving through a place like this, it's burning a lot of the um, material, a lot of the 
um, duff a lot of the leaves and needles um, that would uh, in a year or in a couple of years biodegrade anyway. So what a fire does, as we see here, is it does it very quickly. It's not necessarily releasing that much more carbon um, than would be released by natural decomposition. And if you look at this for us, what we're looking at so often in a burned landscape is all of these standing dead trees. And you can see thousands of standing dead trees. This is the um, Warner Creek fire um, that happened in the 90s, um, and almost 30 years ago. And, um, or it was 30 years ago. And you can see all of these standing trees, and that is the carbon. Those are the big carbon reservoirs um, that both in a live forest and in a dead forest store carbon dioxide and um, slowly, slowly over potentially hundreds of years, these standing dead trees will fall and they will um, biodegrade. But by that time, you can see these new smaller trees growing up and they will have long since um, taken up all of the carbon that uh, a fire would release. Now, um, here's just a quick slide. It's a little bit complicated, um, but it shows how much carbon is released in other forest activities. So if we're really concerned about forest carbon, um, that's just a logging and um, a logging comparison of how much is actually um, removed and how much carbon is released uh, when we log versus when we um, you know, allow a forest to naturally regenerate or, um, to, or, or log it before that. Um, but even though forests are uh, born in fire, even though forests are, um, are often so evolved to fire, we still have a problem, right? We cannot, um, yeah, I mean, we, people are dying and losing their homes um, at an increased rate. Uh, and, and so we need to ask ourselves why. What we're doing currently isn't quite working. Um, and so we go back in history, we look at um, the 1920s and compare that to um, the 1950s, 1960s, even 1940s. There was far more fire. Um, in the American West. This is a graph of fire in the um, 11 Western states. And um, what happened in, uh, you can see here in the mid 40s, um, we went through uh, a cooler period, cooler, wetter period. So in, you know, in any um, decadal or in any century, we'll have um, ocean currents that control a lot of our temperatures and a lot of the rain fall that happens and we go through cooler periods and we go through warmer periods. So uh, the invention, sort of the increase and in mechanization of fire suppression happened in the 40s and 50s, um, post-World War II, and it happened to coincide with a cool wet period. Um, and that made firefighting a little bit easier. Um, it made it very successful and you can see how few acres burned during that time. Um, which was also a time of rapid expansion in the United States. Um, we bought cars, we built suburbs, we did a whole lot of building um, in the wildland urban interface, in places that are uh, fire prone. We also built recreation areas, we built mines, we built roads, um, and we built power lines deep into um, what was once forest, right? That period, um, imagine again, from the what happened between World War II and the mid 80s uh, was a huge period of development in the United States. And we got used to the idea that these places were not going to burn because they hadn't burned in a generation, sometimes in multiple generations. And that's a very reasonable um, thing to get used to, right? Um, but unfortunately, we, we live there. We live there now. Um, and um, we live in places that are prone to fire. Um, and so those places, as you can see on the right side of the graph, uh, we're, we're getting, and in some cases even exceeding, um, some a, a lot of the fire years, the level, the number of acres burned um, in the 20s and 30s. We're approaching those levels again. And it feels crazy. It feels crazy because we haven't seen that in almost 100 years. Um, 
And so we're ramping up a lot of what we do um, to mitigate that, right? We are doing as much fire suppression as we can. We're spending billions of dollars a year on fire suppression. Um, and that's still often the same tactics that we've used for a long time, which is creating a line in the forest or in fields or in chaparral or in grasslands um, that the fire uh, won't cross until it gets as windy as it did when um, I was in the Kincaid fire. And then the other thing we're doing, and this sort of makes sense um, if you think about it, we're pulling what, you know, we're pulling the things that we observe burning out of the forest. We're doing uh, logging, we're thinning, and in some cases we're even doing prescribed fires. Um, and on the outset, that does kind of make sense. If you see uh, trees burning and you want to mitigate fire behavior, um, that might um, that might help, uh, or you can see why it, you would think that might help. Um, and then, worse sometimes, um, kind of the worst is that we're also seeing a lot of um, a lot of uh, timber industry and even politicians um, using fire and the fear of fire as a reason to log. And occasionally, that does mean this kind of um, industrial logging like clear cuts, um, which um, we will talk to in just a moment. We'll talk about in just a moment um, a little bit more. But um, this kind of industrial logging, and when we hear the timber industry saying things like, uh, we know how to deal with the forest, we know how to deal with fire in the forest, um, unfortunately, it's just, it's just inaccurate. There was a really interesting study done about the Douglas Fire Complex, which happened um, a few years ago um, in, in Southern Oregon, um, Southwest Oregon. And um, it turned out that in that study and in many other studies um, in other, uh, other environments that we're starting to really be able to um, look to published papers showing that um, the more we manage uh, for timber production, the more we manage a landscape, um, the more uh, intense and higher intensity, more tree mortality uh, we get when fires move through there, um, when compared to same time, same same weather, same slope, that kind of thing. Um, and then another thing that we're doing, which is actually um, having some some effect on fire behavior when fire moves through um, the landscape, is prescribed burns. And I've had an amazing opportunity to do some. Um, cultural burns with the Yurok um, and Karuk tribes in Northern California um, and had some of the most meaningful experiences I've had making this film um, in, in those landscapes and learned so much about the history of fire. A lot of these burns um, are, are not specifically um, or not certainly not only for um, fire risk reduction, but they're for traditional um, resource production. So that includes um, things like uh, creating willow that's harvestable um, to make baskets, to weave baskets with, um, acorn production, and that sort of thing. Um, now, there's a couple of different... <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, uh, prescribed burns and are, are not quite sufficient, as we've seen. Um, they're not quite working to keep our homes and our communities safe um, for a few different reasons. And um, it's the same reason that thins aren't working either. Um, I interviewed and have worked with a handful of times um, a really brilliant um, uh, scientist named Alexandra Seifert. Um, and her research, she looks at, she tries to figure out why homes that burned burned and why homes that didn't burn survived. And um, looking at all of the fires that she uh, that, that have happened um, in the Western United States with um, and, and looking at the homes that burned and the homes that didn't burn, uh, there's very, very little relationship between actions that happened in the forest. So management decisions farther than 100 feet or certainly in the back country, it's very, very little effect. Um, very little relationship between which homes burn and which homes don't burn. Um, and that's where we get the home ignition zone. 
that hundred feet around a house. Outside of that, um, there's just a very, very little relationship um, with home safety and fire. And then the second thing um, I was really impactful to me was working with um, Tanya Schoenagel uh, in Colorado. She looked at all of the acres um, that have burned uh, in a year and, or excuse me, that have, she looked at all the treatments. So that includes thins and burns that have happened over the last 30 years when we really um, looked hard and worked hard at, uh, re at, at thinning and burning, um, doing what they call fuels reduction treatments. Um, and only 1% of those were even, uh, even um, touched by fire. So all of that effort that we've been putting out there for 30 years, all of the trees that we've cut, all of um, you know, the small number of um, prescribed burns that have happened, only 1% of those have actually come in contact with a wildfire. Um, and as she puts it, that's a very small lever. It's a very small lever um, to reduce fire behavior uh, in the best case scenario. Um, if a fire comes through there. And I think, you know, these things sort of explain why the things that we're doing currently um, are still leading to outcomes that we don't want to have. Uh, outcomes like paradise, where we lost 18,000 structures and 14,000 homes. Um, and so, finally, we've been talking all about forests this whole time, um, but 60% of uh, fires in the West are, um, yeah, only about 40% of fires um, in the West are in forests. So we could cut down every single tree, every single forest in the American West, and then we would still have a fire problem. Um, so we've got to ask ourselves, <clears throat> what do we do? We've got um, all of this money every year, billions and billions of dollars going into fire suppression and going into um, thinning and burning um, and fuels reduction, um, oftentimes at the expense of ecosystems. Um, and so that's the question I've been trying to answer in this film. And so I went to a place called the Institute for um, Business and Home Safety, where they build homes in a lab and burn them down. Um, and it is a cool place to hang out. And um, I got to be there for one of the homes uh, being burned down. And what they do is um, they test, they look for the weak points in homes. They look for the um, ways that we can design and build homes um, better and safer. Um, and here's, here's a little clip from the film I'm working on um, about um, the Institute. What we have here is a mock test building. Half of it is wildfire resistant, and the other half of it is more traditional building structure. And here in the wind chamber, we're going to shoot embers at it. And when they come and impact the building, we're going to see the difference in wildfire resistant building and non wildfire resistant building and how they perform to the ember exposure. Our final safety check we have water curtain on, attack line, and backup line in place. I get really excited about burning houses down. We have a major test chamber, the size of a airplane hangar. Whether it's against hurricane, hail, or wildfire, we crash test structures here. We're convinced that there's a point where you can prevent a loss. We have a wall of fans, it's 105 fans, and we're able to create realistic wind speeds and wind gusts. So all that wind comes at us here. And then we also have these ember generators. These are the ducts that you see coming out of the ground. But what is happening underneath the ground is we have a burn chamber where we're feeding in wood chips and gals. And when that starts to burn, up out of the duct comes those glowing smoldering embers. And that's what you see in a real wildfire, the wildfire exposure that impacts buildings and homes. Fans are on. We're about to start generator startup procedure. Control room ready. Uh, we have that acquisition with cameras up. All right, generators are ready. On your mark, 
So you see, um, this is this is a schematic of what they uh, created in the wind chamber there in the comparison. Um, and these are, I mean, I've you know I've been around a lot of houses that are um, either you know designed well or designed sort of poorly for um, wildfire. And aesthetically, there's very little difference. Um, but in a wildfire, it can really mean the difference between your home and sometimes um, you know your, your your own safety, but your home surviving. Um, and so if you look at um, what they've done, um, they have enclosed um, the um, um. Getting some feedback here. They've enclosed the eaves. Um, they have fire resistant siding, dual pane windows, um, rock mulch instead of uh, wood chips. Um, and they've even uh, done some cool stuff with their deck to make it less um, fire prone. And all of this stuff is um, far cheaper and far more likely to protect your home um, in a fire than treatments in the far back country. Um, and so uh, also talking to Alexander Seifert um, recently, I think that one of the most impactful things that she said to me um, was there are sort of four major um, things that she's that she's uh, you know documented some relationship or or a very strong relationship between um, you know what we can do and homes burning down and in order from least to most um, effective uh, she listed first fuels fuels treatments. Um, it, farther than 100 feet from the home. The next most productive, most successful thing to keep homes safe um, is creating defensible space around your home. So doing some degree of thinning around your home. Um, and then of course, adding that rock mulch instead of bark uh, and wood chips. The third thing is what we're looking at here at IVHS, um, which, is, uh, which is of course home design and building materials. And then the most important thing, the most deciding factor is whether or not you've built your home in a fire prone area. Um, and so I promised that I would give you some things to do um, during the quarantine. This is actually an excellent time to start thinking about um, how do we make our homes and our communities safer before fire season. Um, and I'm gonna just list a few things that people can do um, while we're staying at home, while we um, have a lot of time to think and look at our homes. Um, okay, so the top three things that you can do to a home to make it more uh, resistant to fire are um, one, <clears throat> put mesh uh, covers on your soffit vents. So we're looking at soffit vents. That's the um, kind of the eave of your house. It's an attic vent, those holes. Um, you've probably seen them on your house or other people's homes. Um, during a fire, uh, air heats up in your attic. It goes out the vents in the top of your um, roof and it sucks air in to these soffit vents. And when it sucks air in that has embers in it, your home burns down from the attic. Um, it starts from the inside and burns your home from the outside uh, to the outside, even in a wildfire. And so all you need for that is um, eighth inch mesh, which I'm gonna um, show you a link to in a minute. Um, it's super cheap, super easy. It's one of the, mo the top three most effective things you can do. Um, even more effective than that, number two, is boxing in your eaves. You can see here, um, these uh, outdoor lights are attached to um, some sort of boxing eaves there. That's even better because it doesn't create 
an eddy in the wind, um, a, a place for the wind to circulate, bring embers up into your roof, um, into your attic, um, so it's even safer. And then the third thing, and the top three things you can do, and this is not something you can do during quarantine, probably, but maybe, um, is replace your windows. If you have a single pane window, um, windows in your house, replace them with double pane or, or triple pane windows with the outside being tempered glass. So that's obviously more expensive and a little bit more involved, but it is the number one um, most important factor. Because what happens is, you know, in a wind event that might burn a house down, um, you have strong wind, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. You have um, trees falling down, you have trees burning. And um, if a pane of glass breaks, that's uh, an invitation to embers to move into your house and again, burn it from the inside out. So here is my list of quarantine projects, <laughs> stay at home <laughs> projects. First, um, soft vents. Here is um, what you need to do it. Six inch by 25 foot, um, eighth inch mesh from Lowe's, it's 15 bucks. Um, and you could probably do your whole house with that much. Um, you might even be able to do, you know, you and some of your neighbor's house for that much. Um, and imagine that's one of the top three things. It only costs 15 bucks. You can do it in a few minutes. Um, there are plenty of uh, guides online to do it. Another thing you can do while you're at home, clean your gutters. Embers land in dry duff that's sitting in your gutters like this. Um, if you have vinyl gutters, melts the gutters and those you know, catch on fire and catch the rest of your house on fire. If not, it gets up under your roof um, and can burn your house down just like that. Um, finally, move firewood away from your house. It's really, really easy, but that's just a burnable thing that people often store under their eaves when you live in um, rural, more rural areas. Um, if you live in a city, you probably don't have to do that, but um, if you live anywhere in a um, fire prone area, you need to. And then finally, this is probably pretty doable during the stay at home, um, but landscape five feet around your house with unburnable material. As we saw in that IBHS um, video, the first thing that caught on fire was the, um, the landscaping, the burnable landscaping um, around the house. And you can see right here, they had uh, bark mulch and wood chips, and that's the thing that um, was the vector that caught that particular side of the um, house on fire. So with that, um, I'm going to okay. end it. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, you can follow me uh, on Instagram at Trip Jennings Video. Um, also, Thriving with Fire on Facebook and Instagram um, uh, is where I'm posting a lot of stuff um, and a great resource for cool information on how to stay safe and how to enjoy burn landscapes um, and some cool fire science. Um, so yeah, let's open it up to questions. Or no, let's open it up to Rob. All right, thanks for that trip. Um, and now we're going to turn it over to Rob Clavins. And then after that, we will um, do some questions. If you have some questions, go ahead and write them in and then I'll be moderating some of those after Rob's presentation. Rob, I am giving you presenter powers now. All right, this is exciting. Let's see if it works. Are you able to see that? Yes. Great. Um, yeah. Well, first, thanks, Trip. Uh, that was really great. I've I've learned every time I've heard one of your presentations, I've I've learned something new. Um, so as Aaron mentioned, I'm the Northeast Oregon Field Coordinator for Oregon Wild. Um, in addition to that work, my wife and I we own and operate a bed and breakfast and working farm just outside of Enterprise in in Wallowa County. Um, this is actually the view from our porch a few years ago. Uh, it's a site that we've seen a few times. So fire directly impacts our lives, our livelihood, and, and our community, as does the health of our forests and public land. So this is something that I, I also certainly take personally. Um, in setting this up, I want to note, I, I have a biology degree. I read a lot of scientific papers, spend time with scientists, foresters, conservationists, and industry folks alike. Um, and I spend as much time as, as I can in the woods, but please don't make any mistake, I am not myself a scientist. What my job is, is to advocate for Oregon Wild's mission and our members in, in a manner that's informed by the best available science, guided by mainstream conservation values. And I think also it's important to do it with the humility um, of acknowledging that our just our limitation on, on our knowledge and ability to understand what is really an infinitely complex natural world. 
Um, for those of you who don't know us well, Oregon Wild's mission is to protect and restore Oregon's wildlands, wildlife, and waters as an enduring legacy for future generations. Um, I've worked at the organization for over a decade and, and spent sort of a little bit of time working in nearly every one of our program areas. Um, I did hikes and events, uh, wildlife advocacy and policy, uh, enforcement of the roadless rule, forest collaboration, and, and also trying to secure some enduring protections for, for our public lands. Um, these days, I'm primarily focused on forage, forest management and, uh, and public lands protection. Uh, these are a couple photos from fires that have occurred here in the Blue Mountains over the last five years or so that were often called catastrophic when they were actually burning. Um, and if you're watching, I, I assume that you um, have a lot of reasons to appreciate our forests, so I, I won't dwell here, but I want to recognize that many of the most important values of our forests are not quantifiable uh, or just for clear human benefit. Um, I'm reminded by uh, of a quote, one of my favorites from uh, Aldo Leopold, who said, um, the last word in ignorance is a man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? If the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. Um, for my wife and I, our public lands play a major role in why I chose to call this part of uh, Oregon home. Um, and I think like a lot of you, we appreciate those places now maybe more than ever. Um, they're critical to our bottom line, but they provide us with something that, that's actually far more important than that in the end. Uh, this is the Sunflower Fire in the Umatilla National Forest. Um, I got to see this fire in action in, in 2014 um, and revisited it last fall and saw nothing catastrophic about what had happened. Um, I think Tripp has made the point pretty eloquently that fire is natural, it's an essential process, and just like we can't stop hurricanes or floods, you know, those of us who choose to live in the West, especially places like this, you know, we've really made the choice to, to live near fire. And likewise, um, you know, Tripp made this point very well, but I want to make sure you hear it really clearly from us. Uh, there are legitimate concerns about wildfire. Um, this is a photo from the 2015 Canyon Creek Fire that was just uh, south of John Day. Um, I drove down the Canyon Road a few days after it reopened, and it was heartbreaking uh, to see people sifting through the rubble of their homes. Um, there's nobody that's going to celebrate when somebody loses their life, their home, or their livelihood to fire. And of course, you know, smoke can have serious health impacts, especially for vulnerable populations. Firefighting is dangerous. It's expensive. Um, that said, Tripp made the case, um, and I'd reinforce it, that a lot of the hysteria around fire is absolutely not legitimate. Um, these are two pictures of popular hiking trails near my house that are, quote, recovering from, from very recent fires. Um, they remain popular, and I don't look forward to the next big fire that's going to happen in our view shed, but I also recognize it is going to happen. Um, and in the meantime, I don't want to see us destroying the forest in order to save it. Um, likewise, I doubt that any of us want to see changes to places we love, but it's worth recognizing nature's dynamic and fires are a part of those systems. And again, to go back to Aldo Leopold, um, with the rest of the quote that I, I read earlier, you know, if you love the land, you can't just pick up a, a, and choose the parts you like. So forgiving some archaic language from his quote, he said, conservation is a state of harmony between men and land. By land is meant all of the things on, over, or in the earth. Harmony with land is like harmony with a friend. You cannot cherish his right hand and chop off his left. That is to say, you cannot love game and hate predators. You cannot conserve the waters and waste the ranges. And I think the same could really be said for, uh, for fire and forests. But when fire season happens, nearly everyone buys into the fear and hyperbole. Uh, we see even responsible media outlets sort of breathlessly talk of fire in these really apocalyptic terms. Uh, we see sometimes even well-meaning politicians rush in to solve a crisis. And then we see the timber industry manipulating us to all believe that the only solution is to get back to old school logging uh, under the guise of, of nicer terms like fuels reduction, salvage, and restoration. Um, and so under that pressure, agencies full of staff who should know better, but sometimes don't, they give in to that pressure. Um, and I think to be fair, we're all a little bit susceptible to that. Um, I don't like when guests to our B&B are canceling due to smoke. Um, and I remember pretty well how so many of the eco-conscious Portlanders uh, were panicking during the, during the Eagle Creek fire. Um, but I don't think it's an excuse for uh, those who are given the responsibility to manage and conserve our, our public lands. Um, and these are photos from two relatively recent examples of the Forest Service cutting old growth in both the Blue and Wallowa Mountains using fire as an excuse. It's still very real and happening today. Um, and I think it's really, you know, it goes back to the old saying that when all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And that seems to be really true for the timber industry and to an extent the Forest Service and other public lands whose budgets have been dramatically cut um, for seemingly everything but fire suppression, logging and extraction, and who are in, under increasing political pressure, especially under this administration, uh, to increase the pace and scale of logging 
and really measure success only in acres logged and board feet that are sent to mills. You know, whatever the perceived problem, we are told that logging is the solution. If we've got too many bugs in the forest, we should cut the trees down. Unhealthy forests, log them. Rural economic woes, start cutting trees. Can't fund the, the school district or the police department. Maybe if we just cut a few more big trees per acre, uh, we could start doing those sorts of things. Similarly, you know, now that almost no one qu questions climate science, uh, the industry is telling us that the only way to solve um, that crisis is to log our forest, despite all the science that says otherwise. Um, and finally, I think, you know, before fires burn, logging is justified as fuels uh, reduction or restoration. Then the fire burns and they want to cut the remaining trees in the name of salvaging economic value. Um, and so really, we just see industry playing up fears and peddling what is often cherry picked science that demands simply more logging. We see politicians buy in um, and pressure public agencies, which is why we see more and more efforts to undermine environmental laws, skip robust environmental review, um, and then just sidestep transparency and, and meaningful public input. Uh, and I want to note that Oregon Wild acknowledges that there are certainly times and places where, where thinning is appropriate. But so often when we give an inch, we see agencies and, and some of our sort of nominal partners often take a mile. Um, so we think it's really important when the Forest Service is talking about logging for these reasons to say, why here? Why now? Uh, is it going to work? Are there other options available? What's the ecological cost? What's the long-term plan? Is it sustainable? Um, are we going to allow natural res uh, natural processes to play themselves out in the future? Or are we just going to see needless uh, or see endless interventions into the future? Um, and what's really frustrating is nearly everyone seems to agree that the extent to the extent that our forests are unhealthy, it's because of decades of fire suppression, overgrazing, unsustainable logging, and other mismanagement. But rather than address those issues, we're told the primary way to restore our forests is to log them. Um, we don't address the fire deficit inappropriate development, roads, grazing, and all the other things that are, are really the actual causes of the problem. So what should we do? Um, and uh, Tripp mentioned uh, research from Tanya Sh uh, Schoenagel. Um, she and her colleagues looked at a great deal of peer-reviewed science and came to a number of key takeaways. So it's really a comp uh, compilation of uh, a number of, of scientific papers. And the first observation was that fire se size and frequency will increase under a warmer and drier climate. Fuel reductions on federal lands do little to reduce acreage burned and homes lost, which as Tripp pointed out, is, is really the problem we're so often told we're trying to address. Not all forests need restoration uh, or active management to restore those forests. And then even high severity fires often have ecological benefits, um, which is part of why Oregon Wild often argues for fire use plans. Uh, and we're pleased last year to see that a few forests around the state were allowing some natural fires to burn. They also noted that insect outbreaks don't necessarily make fires worse, like wind, uh, fire, erosion. Insects are a natural disturbance agent in our forests, and though they kill trees, um, they don't always add to the fire risk, especially when you when you put that out over a longer period of time. Uh, also, land use planning can address fire concerns and fire risk. Uh, and finally, managing more fires to burn safely can reduce risk and increase ecological benefit. Again, appropriate thinning has a place, but nowhere in those fundamental takeaways do I come away with the idea that a return to industrial forestry on our shared public lands is what's going to address the legitimate concerns about fire. And this is important. Unfortunately, just because a project is called a safety project or a restoration project or thinning or that it came out of a collaborative process doesn't make it so. Um, and basically, in sum, uh, this article and this compilation of articles said we can and we must learn to live with wildfire. So Oregon Wild's been working on forest conservation since 1974, and, and sometimes we confuse people because it's really hard to put us in a box. Um, to some, we're litigious radicals. Uh, to others, we're sellouts because we sometimes come to agreements with agencies and industry. Um, we really feel like it's important that our decisions be driven by science, conservation values, and be workable in the real world as it exists. And that can be really difficult, and, and we're always trying to learn and do better. Um, some of our work gets a lot of attention. You know, I know when I was working for Wolves, for better and for worse, I was regularly in local, state, and even national news. Um, now I work much more behind the scenes and uh, with a number of other staff, but that work is still really important, even if it's not quite as sexy and exciting as, as uh, what makes the newspapers. Um, and our strategy, I think our, our, our philosophy is really to always try to find common ground first, um, to encourage agencies and, and other decision makers to do the right thing. Um, we do that through public comments on projects, collaboration with agencies and stakeholders, and on-the-ground work 
ground truthing timber sales, checking the facts and, and monitoring projects as they're being carried out. But when it's necessary, we are absolutely not afraid to stand up for public values and healthy landscapes. Um, we do that through objections, appeals, and as a last resort, sometimes we do it by going to court, uh, holding agencies accountable to their own laws and rules. And of course, every day we're having to fight uh, to defend basic environmental protections in the state and, and national level. Our opponents are really powerful, um, and that power largely comes from money, and I would argue sowing misinformation and misunderstanding. I think our strength comes from the fact that we're representing mainstream conservation values that are informed by science. Um, and that's why we need members and supporters to help us take action, to organize, and, and to be heard. So um, as, as you leave this today, and of course stick around for the questions um, for TRIP, um, I just ask that you support Oregon Wild. Um, we do the big stuff, but we also do the dirty work, like commenting on hundreds of projects that you've never heard of. Um, so please, uh, please support us and, and please support the organizations that represent your values. I'd also encourage you to check out um, some of our programs like the Oregon Wild ones, which helps people learn the tools to take action uh, and make a change. Um, and so I don't have a specific action for you to take today, but just look for those opportunities to be informed, to counter misinformation and take action, um, and really to hold people accountable. I think that's especially important um, during fire hysteria season, which is coming up, um, and especially with politicians and the media in particular. Um, you know, don't take the clickbait. Um, tell them what they're getting wrong. Ask them to do better. Uh, doing that really has an impact. Um, and so I think with that, I just want to want to thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, wish everybody well in a challenging time. Uh, we're going to continue doing the the hard work um, to stand up for your values and and hope you'll continue to support our work in return. Um, you know, and knowing every day that I represent people like you really fuels me in in my work, uh, even if I can't see you. Um, so with that, I will leave it for uh, for questions, which I think Aaron will will take over here. Oh, good. That's me. Uh, really, really falling out over the top of my uh, my hiking backpack belt right there uh, in the stomach area. Um, yeah, we've got a we've got a couple questions. I, I don't want to hold people too long, um, but I think um, one of the ones off the back. Um, Trip, you've been you started this off talking about this film you've been working on. Do you know where and when that will debut? Oh, I have you muted again. Just a second. I have to send you another unmute request because it doesn't let me do it. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, well, we did know um, we were going to premiere at a film festival uh, this spring, um, but of course, film festivals aren't really happening. Um, you know, which is reasonable but sad. Um, so we, it'll be out this summer. Stay tuned. Um, it, it will be available for streaming, and we're not exactly sure which streaming service yet. So, big answer is standby and follow us on social media and we will definitely let you know we'll let oregon wild know for sure hopefully all we'll let all of our friends know um what are these questions and rob i don't know how many of these conference calls you've been on so i might talk about it a little bit if you haven't been on them but are there fire reduction timber management recommendations that should be advocated as it pertains to the governor's executive order on climate change um and so this is relating to uh um Oregon's Governor Kate Brown has had an executive order on um, uh, carbon reduction, um, but she also had a, uh, a, a wildfire task force that had some other recommendations. So I don't know if you want to start addressing those, and I can I can talk about some of the uh, work we're going to be doing uh, advocating for things going forward there. Yeah, and, and Aaron, I think you might be better uh, suited to answer some of those questions. And it, it is important because, again, I think one of the big things is that the rhetoric around this stuff often just doesn't match the reality. So you see a public safety fuel reduction project that's um, sa that's said to be all about thinning, um, and it may be, um, but it often may not be as well. And I think we see that as well with, with legislation. Um, and certainly uh, in the climate discussion, the timber industry has, um, you know, though they were uh, largely denying climate change very recently, now that they've accepted it, um, of course, climate change is a reason to log ever more. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of the science, um, and, and Tripp had that, that good graphic showing how 
um, you know, harvesting trees and sending them to the mills, when you think about the whole life cycle of it, um, you're actually not sequestering nearly as much carbon as leaving trees to grow. And there's just a ton of science about that um, that shows those things to be true. Uh, and so I think it's really uh, we have to be really careful. Uh, and I know that there were time that the there were times in some of the iterations of the climate bill uh, where a lot of that pseudoscience uh, was 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 being put in there, um, or we saw people being given credits for doing the things that they were already doing rather than actually changing their behavior in a beneficial way. Um, and the timber industry is continues to be really strong. People have said that in in Oregon. Uh, people have said that what coal is to West Virginia, timber is to to Oregon, and that's not a huge exaggeration. Uh, and then I think the last thing I'd say was, you know, the the governor had this fire panel, um, and it was very heavy on people who had strong biases towards sort of traditional uh, management of public lands and fire via fire suppression and increased logging. Uh, and the few folks who were more conservation minded and science minded had some pretty strong things to say about uh, what those recommendations were that came along with a multi-billion dollar uh, funding ask. Um, I don't know all the details, but that's kind of my, my general understanding. Uh, so it's really important that we continue to be a part of that conversation and make sure that the, the real science and, and conservation values are being represented. And I think, you know, one of the things that we'll be advocating for in um, the legislature it, um, when you know the legislature convenes again in, in the long session, and, and maybe even if it's it could be part of a special session that may deal with some of the pandemic issues, are some of the health and home issues surrounding smoke, um, and you know looking at some of those things that Trip talked about as those recommendations about uh, home hardening and air purifiers and smoke shelters, you know. The smoke that we get in some areas of Oregon can be coming from all the way as far as as California and and Canada, um, and you know there are there are limited things we can do to control that. Um, so focusing on some of those health impacts and those things that prevent homes and communities from being impacted by fire are some of the things that we'll be advocating for uh, in the legislature and in terms of things that the governor can do and how it ties to health and respiratory issues um, coming out of some of these pandemic issues. Um, we got a whole bunch of uh, questions at the last minute, so I haven't been able to look at all of them. Uh, let's see. So I, um, I'll just read this one. I've heard it argued that since Oregon's forests are so artificial from a decade of logging uh, that they need thinning to remain healthy, how can these two uh, issues be effectively balanced? I wanna, I'll take a stab at that real quick. Looks like you're thinking. Um, so uh, there's a lot of great forest in Oregon that is very healthy, that is native forest. Um, and there are a lot of tree plantations and tree plantations have, um, tree plantations are very dangerous when it comes to fire. Um, and so if we're gonna do, I mean, if, if we ever want those to um, sort of function as, as a forest, uh, it's, you know, something is gonna need to happen. A disturbance of some sort is gonna need to happen and that's either fire coming through and burning a lot of them or doing some thinning in those plantations. I mean, there are, you know, when you see trees growing just a couple feet apart, um, you, you're looking at a fire bomb. Um, and so, you know, as, as uh, the other folks have mentioned, if we're gonna thin, yeah, there's some places that it makes sense and that's places that we've really already mucked up. Yeah, and I think that's, that's right. I think uh, another thing to think about too is, um, this maybe is a little nerdy, but what is the state of our forest versus the function of our forest? And so often we look at what the forest looks like and we forget about the ways that it, it got, how it became that way and, and what those natural disturbance processes are. Fires grow, or, or sorry, forests grow, they die, they, they're regenerated and they die at different scales, time frames, and for different reasons. And so restoring those natural processes is something that, that I think is really important to think about as well. And so there are places where thinning makes sense. Uh, and you know, I think to Tripp's point, in the front country, near homes, um, that makes sense. We're comfortable with those sorts of things, but putting a fire break miles away from, from the nearest structure um, you know, doesn't, make a whole, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And maybe you also ought to think about where we are putting those homes in the first place. 
Um, and then I think it's also important to note that, you know, logging is not the same as fire. Um, a trip showed those photos of when a fire comes through, there's a lot of stuff left. Um, when they log, all of those things are taken off the landscape and what is left are roads and invasive species and uh, compacted soils. And we have to think about those trade-offs when we start to talk about um, how we're going to restore our far forest to those natural states. And so we can log them or we can actually let those some of those natural processes play out. And we started to see some of that uh, acceptance grow even in the Forest Service where uh, wind conditions allow and they're far enough away from structures, fires are allowed to burn. Um, and then again, there are places where I think it is okay. And, and that was uh, something where, for instance, if we have a forest that has legitimate old growth in it, uh, and because of fire suppression, um, there haven't, there has, it's missed a bunch of fire cycles, um, maybe that's where we can go in and thin so that a fire can come back into that landscape. And it's just important that we actually let that happen. And then the last thing I just would say too is that some forests are messy um, and they're meant to be messy and they're meant to burn and they're meant to be fire bombs. Um, and so fire is not always bad. It's just the, the wrong fires in the wrong places that are bad. So, um, and then I think to that larger point too, um, you know, I look at our public lands and sometimes I can say, yeah, this piece of, of ground is denser than it would have been generally over history. But suddenly you zoom out and you see the sea of, of private lands clear cutting that's surrounding it. And suddenly I'm thinking, boy, if I'm a grouse or um, if I'm a goshawk or if I'm any of those other species that depend on those messy forests or a fisher, um, I'm really glad that piece of ground is there. And I really hope that nobody restores it. Um, and so, I, you know, I think that really looking at our public lands as a place where natural processes can play themselves out um, and we can restore those natural processes is really what we should be focused on, even when we do go in and do some of that active work. I think that actually answered a couple of people's questions on that one, Rob. So uh, thank you. I'm going to wrap it up. Uh touching on a few things that came up. Yes, there will be a presentation next week. Uh, it will be a film, the film This Land, um, and it'll be talking a little bit about uh, national monuments and um, some of the history of public lands and how do we make them more welcome to people who have been historically um, excluded from those, those places. Um, and then somebody asked, uh, Rob, what was the name of your uh, bed and breakfast? It's Barking Mad and it's fantastic. I um, mean, you should go there. Um, when we're allowed to travel. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, uh, thanks everybody for the questions. This uh, will be um, uploaded and you'll be able to watch it. So if there are slides um, that you you know wanted to go back and look at, um, those will be available uh, once I get this uh, online and I'll email it out to everybody tomorrow. All right, so thanks everybody for tuning in and we hope to see you next week. Thanks.